Well, hello, everybody, and again, welcome to another episode of Meepleville Meets. This week, we are extremely privileged and honored to have arguably the most prolific game designer ever join us on this episode. So please welcome Dr. Reiner Knizia to our interview. Hello. Thank you, Reiner. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for joining us. I'm very well. How are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. Uh, one of the things I want to start off real quick, I was interested to find out that you lived in England for quite a while. Yes, um, before I came a full time, became a full-time game designer, I actually worked in the IT and banking industry and that brought me to England in about 25, 27 years ago. And I initially was there on an assignment for 18 months uh -huh. It became 23 years, and finally the <laughs> Brexit brought me home to Germany, Munich. Oh, okay, and the reason I'm so interested about that is because I too lived in England. I lived out in the West Country for about four years. What part of England did you live in? Um, I lived in Windsor, just uh, west of London. Okay, I lived all the way west of the M5 uh, in Somerset, right on the Bristol Channel, in a little town called okay. Minehead. Don't know if you've ever been out there by any chance? Uh, not in the little town, but of course in the area, of course. I mean, Somerset is not that big, or England yeah. is not that big, so it's easy to travel. <laughs> that is true, that is true. And also, because you, you seem to have been around a lot and studied a lot, I saw that you actually studied here in the United States at Syracuse University. Yeah, that's correct. When I was um, uh, at, at my university in Germany, they had an exchange program um, with uh, the US, with several universities actually, and so I uh, followed my um, uh, professor with whom I wrote my thesis, who was also a professor in Syracuse, and we uh, spent some quite some good time in uh, America, and um, yes, I got my master's degree there as well. Oh, very good. So you've lived in America, you lived in England, you live in Germany, and you are native German, correct? I'm native German, and I also had the pleasure of living for a while in Vienna and Austria, which um, I enjoyed very much as well. Oh, nice. Okay, well, if you were to rank all of the places you live, <laughs> where would you put America, England, Germany, and Austria? I think that's a difficult question and possibly <laughs> impossible to answer. Um, I think times in America when I was there were a bit easier than they are currently. Um, so it also depends in which time frame and which political frame you're talking about. But I am very much internationally oriented. And uh, of course, the games business is very international. So I just enjoy meeting people from different cultures and uh, experience the different, uh, different local uh, cultures and local customs. And that is very, very true. And it's so good that you are international and you enjoy that because um, gaming is so universal now when i was younger one of my favorite movies was close encounters of the third kind do you are you familiar with that film yes, and I have seen it. yes and one of the themes they were putting through was how music is the international language however since i've become so passionate about gaming throughout my whole life just as you are as well i kind of feel gaming is a little bit more of the universal inter international language what would you say about that Again, it depends where people come from. Um, people say mathematics is the universal language throughout the universe, um, but that's not what you are alluding to. I think over the last years or decades, we have seen an enormous globalization throughout the world. And that means there are lots of products, there are lots of means of communication which have just become much more widely available. I remember I got um, email in the year 2000. So it's not that long ago. Uh, so the world has changed. And I think the big interest in games and gaming is the biggest, you know, essentially really the biggest uh, leisure industry around the world. So bigger than movies, bigger than music, um, bigger than books. Um, so with this respect, yes, because everything is global. I think uh, gaming has brought uh, people together maybe more than any other genre because when we play games we are of course very actively engaged and not just passively movie, uh, watching a movie. I mean it's not a valuation but it is simply saying when you bring people together actively maybe that even counts for more 
and therefore, yes, it is it is certainly a gateway to many people. Oh yeah, absolutely. I would agree 100. percent And since your training, would you would you say first and foremost that you are a mathematician? Is that correct? I am by training a mathematician. I would more say I'm a scientist, and certainly I have a scientific handwriting in a way. And probably, okay. I mean, you know. I have always been interested in sciences and I've done a lot of reading and a lot of experimenting if you want. And I think uh, this kind of shapes your view of the world. And so even though it's subconscious, uh, I will probably have a little bit of more mathematical, systematic view of the world than other people. Uh, well, not, not exceptionally. There are other mathematicians, there are other scientists, but there are also singers, there are artists, there are, are painters, and they probably have a slightly different approach again. And this is good because that gives us variety. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Of course. Now, the combination of the two um, I'm sure mixes very, very well with gaming. So if you could do a little bit and just talk about how the absolute finiteness, if that's a correct term, I don't know, of, of math, because it is, um, you, you know what I'm looking for, and then intertwining that with games to make it that universal language, um, how does your training, your mathematical training, interject into your designing of games? Yes. I mean, what I love about our industry is, and that's very different to many other industries, what I love is that people come from all different backgrounds and from all different directions with all different types of handwriting, um, but they all love games and we are all joined together in the love of games. So with this respect, um, my handwriting is as I say, the, the mathematics. And mathematics helps a lot by building models. And of course, games are sort of building a model of uh, our world or of a specific scene which we want to experience in the game. Uh, however, there is a danger side to it as well. And uh, I have a quote which I like very much from an Austrian uh, psychologist, uh, Paul Watzlawick. And he said, if all you have is a hammer, soon everything in the world will look like a nail. Uh, and that means, uh, careful, do not have the solution before you have the problem. So having the hammer. Um, with this respect, people do not want to do mathematics. People want to play games. And that means it's about fun. It's about entertainment. It's about enjoyment. And it's not about calculation. It's not about uh, analytics. And therefore, even so, my handwriting, my background helps me as other backgrounds help other designers. Um, it, is, it just goes that far. And then you have to take yourself back and say, what am I doing? I'm not building a mathematical model. Yes. Right, right, right. No, I, I would agree 100%. And I've also read that um, one of the first games you designed was around when you were eight years old. So I, I want to ask you, was did the did the math and say the game designing your love of games did they kind of parallel each other throughout your life i wouldn't make such a strong connection between math and games actually i mean but i it mean is, as far as your love you know what i mean your passion yeah, yes i mean it's i you you're absolutely right i i uh, created my first games when i was younger than 10 years uh, i grew up in a small town in southern germany and uh, the only shop that sold games there was the barber. It was it was a small town, and my pocket money wasn't enough to buy all the games, and his uh, selection wasn't very great, so that drove me very quickly then by being fascinated from various themes to create them into games. But I also remember that I... Um, it, it's funny. I remember that I did... I had little cars and I drove them through all types of tubes and measured how far they went and which one went further under which condition on which carpet. So I think there is statistics there as well. And then I was very fascinated by Monopoly money and I actually made my own. There was no desktop publishing at that time. I mean, okay. and I'm, there was not even a photocopier at that time. So my father, who was an architect, had kind of a um, 
machine with a big uh, tumble and uh, so I actually painted my own mummies and I had stacks of mummies which fascinated me and made games around that, more role-playing games. And so you see um, statistics, mathematics, um, packs of money, banking and games, gaming. So that's where I ended up in life. Right, right. Yes, I see that. So let me ask you, since you're such, since you're so well known, so prolific in the gaming world, and you're very international, um, can you explain to me, because I'm not quite sure how this happened or how it came about, but how did like Germany sort of become the epicenter for the Euro game? Like, can you explain that since you've been around and what have you decided is the reason? Okay. Yes, I think... I can explain it in the same way as all the marketing people explain the past, always dead sure about what happened, but they never quite, you know, they're never quite right about the future. And therefore you also have to doubt the explanations of the past. <laughs> Meaning after having insulted all the marketing people, <laughs> um, I have my view, but if it is true, I don't know. Um, because when I lived in, in the UK, in England, uh, people there also told me that uh, England used to be a very rich paradise for playing and then it somewhat became a little bit of a desert where you have lots of good packaging and marketing and advertising, but the contents of the games sometimes isn't that great. And I'm painting black and white here. I think the, the one very typical remarkable point in Germany, and that's my explanation, is that playing games is a family, not business, is a family activity. And so the custom of playing games is carried forward from generation to generation. And therefore there is a big demand for games. And that means it enriches the publishers to give you a wide variety of choices. Uh, and I believe that that the acceptance that games is something for the whole family, not just for kids, is, for example, different to how it used to be in America, uh, where the games was more the kids stuff. And then there was a more serious role playing. But the families may have been, particularly with the adults, have been lost a little bit in the middle. And so I think the so-called Euro games, where the theme is not in the foreground, but the me mechanism, the game system is in the foreground, then fill the gap and fill the niche. And I think um, that probably led to, um, to this story also being very successful. I don't want to go into German engineering and all this stuff because I think <laughs> they would be overdoing it, but I'm sure uh, a good marketing person could build that in as well. Right, right. And in, in what you just alluded to and what you just talked about from your experiences, did you actually see that in the different places you live, say United States, England, Germany? Yes. Could you see how it was well more woven into the family um, sort of dynamic in Germany more than opposed to the UK and the United States? I didn't really see it when I lived in the places, but I saw it very much when I traveled for games business. When I talk to the different publishers, when I talk to the different people at conventions, and uh, I realize that the view of what is a game quite differs from company to company or from, from country to country. I had one key uh, experience with a game, uh, which was a game about Egypt. Okay. Uh, and it was quite, quite two decades, two and a half decades ago. Uh, and I took this game with me to the US and I showed it to a publisher. I put it on the table uh -huh. and the publisher waved it off right away and said, no, no, let's not look at this one. We already have a game about Egypt. Oh. <laughs> and I wanted to say, yeah, but let's have a look at the game. Said, no, no, no. So I understood that for this publisher, the theme was the game. I see. Uh -huh. And then... Just a few weeks later, I saw a German publisher being back in Germany. And I put the game on the table there. And the publisher said, oh, we already have a game about Egypt, but it doesn't matter. Let us look at the game first, and then we see what we do about the theme. So very different view. And you, you know, in, in the US, you have Dungeons and Dragons very popular. And this yeah. is, I mean, it's probably overstating it, but you have a 
a similar base mechanism for many of these adventures. People actually love that they know how to play it, and then they want to experience the different challenges, the different themes, yes. uh, the different environments. Uh, whereas in Germany or in Europe, you would much more be accused of um, kind of copying yourself by doing the same system all over again. So people want to see a different system. So there's a different focus. If you look into um, Japan, for example, there are more the abstract games or more the, because Japan is a more a very ruled society, but then yep. every society needs it breakouts and then you have the crazy uh, um, costumes and the mangas and and so when i was in japan i saw that very much one one thing were more formal approach and then the very crazy approach which right. is a balance again in china we have a market currently a big market but it is a growing market i would compare it yeah. with the market in germany maybe in the 80s uh, okay. and there's nothing wrong or right about being more developed or less developed it is just that in in china uh, we are more talking about games which are more simple, which involve, according to the situation, very often grandparents playing with the children mm -hmm. because the parents are at work. So um, the, the different environment, cultural environment, um, family environments shape the games and then also how much they have been developed. I mean, so there is, there is just a beginning of games. I mean, China produces most of our games, yes. with respect to playing and in the, in, in, in the family culture, they are, so they wouldn't have the sophisticated games. Of course, there's always a few gamers, but from the vast population, uh, it's again a different market. And understanding the different markets is, first of all, very exciting, but mm -hmm. also is part of a basis for success, of course, to show what fits where. Right, you know exactly, and that's a that's a good point you uh, bring up, Reiner, because that's kind of where I'd like to uh, talk about next. So everything you were just discussing about like the different cultures, Japan, China, UK, Germany, America, where um, they see things different, and then we were talking about mathematics, the universality of that. I noticed in a lot of your games, there seems to be um, a theme of colors and numbers where you have taken those two things, which of course are universal, everybody knows colors, everybody knows yes. numbers, but they do speak to everybody. So how is it, or what is sort of your dynamic secret sauce for a lack of a better term? What is it that is it that is Reiner Knizia's signature, perhaps utilizing the colors and numbers to make sure games are universal, that they speak to everybody? Having already explained that I see myself as a scientist, or I certainly am a scientist, scientists try to reduce a lot of information and take redundancy out to and, and bring it down to a number of basic principles. And therefore, my games, and that's probably my handwriting, my games are have short rules, but the principles are kind of self-evident, but they're so deep so that the people who apply it in the game then make a deep game out of it because of what they do with the principles. So for me, I give some basic rules and then the game itself becomes a platform where the individual players can hopefully bring in some of their personality of more aggressive uh, attacking play or more defensive play. I'm not talking about war games, but I'm talking about the general approach to a business game, an economic game. Um, and for me, it's important that people have a very quick access to the game, that the entrance hurdle is low uh, and that the game essentially engages people so that once they have played it one time, they say, oh, now I know even better, I want to play again. So there is always something new to experience in the game. So I'm not the storyteller. The storytellers are the opposite. They create a lot of redundancy. They create lots of details. That means long rules for every little aspect of the game. Thematically, there is a tile, there's a card, there's an explanation, there's text. And this sometimes, and I'm biased, leads to more administration in the game and leads to long rules and uh, this I feel this narrows my experience and enjoyment of being myself and being able to concentrate on my strategy and concentrate on the games. 
on the gameplay as such. Yes. And so my natural preferences are then reflected, I believe, in the game. And you, t you talk about numbers and colors. That is a very quick approach where you have to translate relatively little. Of course, a good thematic positioning is, is important. I mean, we have now also very successful abstract games, but of course, the theme is also a very important communicator because yes. we talked about Egypt. If I take a game from the shelf, which has a pyramid on it and a pharaoh on it, and it shows me that I am there as a pharaoh in the game and building pyramids, I immediately know in what environment I am. I know the challenges. So um, a theme communicates a lot to the potential player or buyer what they are getting. So with this respect, it's very important. And it's also, of course, very important that the game mechanics in this theme interweave. There are two ways to do that. And I know my answer is long, but uh, no, I no, think no. it's important to, to... It took me a long time to understand myself what I'm doing. And I actually benefited a lot from a few interviews I gave and where people then analyzed what I'm doing and said, yes, they're actually right. And so I understood better what I'm doing because how do you know? Um, so let's say we have a... I want to establish a trend in the game. For, I mean, just a typical example, uh, we are in a desert oasis and we have a market, a bazaar, and now how do I know that silk becomes more expensive or less expensive? Um, and uh, what I don't like is, I mean, personally, there's no judgment about games, it's just for me. What I don't like is when I get a card and it says, okay, now uh, silk becomes rarer and therefore silk prices go up by three dots or whatever. And then you establish this on some kind of a scale and uh, so things happen to you. What I like to see is that there is a caravan coming from far and I see that they have loaded silk. So, okay, I have a holding of silk. What does it mean if this caravan comes in? Probably there will be more silk offered. Therefore, the prices will probably go down because there are more sellers. So I might actually then already before the event happens, already start selling my silk. And that means the price is already, because I'm selling, go down even before the actual event happens. And then prices may actually go down that far through the anticipation that before the caravan comes, people start buying again because they say we are so low, low now, it can only go up. And so what you actually experience is the trend itself. It, it emerges in your head. It is, it is how trends work because uh, you don't get a card or you don't get something stated but it is, it is a psychological factor. And so this is just a little example how I probably on a much more subtle and deeper level try to make you experience the various themes. And when people look from a surface and there's opinion around there, Knizia games are not so thematic. And in some aspects that's very true and in some aspects it's very wrong because mm -hmm. if you look from a superficial level, yes, you don't immediately see the theme in all the details, but when you play it, you feel it, you experience it. That's at least what I'm aiming for. Okay, but let me ask you a little bit about that, Doctor, because a lot of your games, I'm sure, just like many games, when they get reprints or in other languages, or sometimes they do that, they do change the theme. So have you noticed perhaps a design you had at the beginning with this particular theme may have become better with a different theme? Or how how do maybe different cultures, different countries, um, how do they um, adapt or, you know, do, do yeah. different themes affect different countries, different people differently? Yeah. I'm not sure if I would go that far with my interpretation of what the reasons are. Okay. But yes, sometimes there are cultural reasons, country reasons. Usually it is just the taste of the publisher or their anticipation what will sell or will not sell. Okay. One example, I had my original card game Schottentotten, which is this battle line. line. Yeah. Uh, exactly battle line, you say, uh -huh. uh, because it's battle line in America. So you have these nine boundary uh, stones and I placed it in Scotland 
and called it Schotten Totten uh, because of the Hotten Tots, and I thought that was funny. And uh, the publisher took the name, and it's it's a it's a thematic positioning. It's a relatively abstract game in this game. Colors and numbers. Play cards, yeah, make combinations. Go. Yeah, you say it is. Yeah, uh -huh. all my games are colors and numbers. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, but you 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 play that, and you try to win the individual cornerstones or or border stones. Yes, yes. and. Um, when I offered this to GMT in America, mm -hmm. uh, they they're a little bit of a war game company. They preferred a more war game style uh, theme, so they went into the ancient uh, into the ancient battle lines. And so now you're not having the crazy Scots uh, fighting over their thiefdoms, but you have now got two armies standing uh, across each other and battling over the ground. And so it's the same. It is almost the same game. Um, but it's it's a different positioning. Now, I wouldn't say that America is more military than some of the European countries and so on. So I don't think it's the culture as such. The markets are maybe different. There are some more war games uh, and, and there were some more war games in, in the past times than there are in Europe, particularly in Germany. With the war history, war games are not very well recognized and people are still very sensitive about that. Right. So, that, of course, plays into that. But with um, the nice side aspect, with um, Battle Line, we also added some strategy cards. So there's a second pack of cards, which when you replenish your hand, you can either take normal standard cards or you can take uh, one of the strategy cards. And that has special effects. There's some text on it because, talking black and white, Americans, a specific uh, gaming group in America, likes this complexity. There has oh, to be some cards and some extra things. Uh, and it's not, as I say, it's not quite my handwriting, but of course, I mean, I, I'm not a purist. So right. of course we said, okay, that makes sense. We'll put a few extra cards in there and we give it a little bit more depth, a little bit more variety. Uh, and with this respect, more individual cards, more theme, which you can see immediately. Yes, and that's right. uh, that communicated more the battle line aspect. Okay, so that, that that brings us to an interesting point where you said you had it shot in Totten and you had it in the Scottish, I believe you said countryside and all that kind of stuff, and then you brought it to GMT. How does your decision go into submitting games to publishers? Like, say for instance, you have game A, B, and C in development. Do you just take all three and go to X publisher, or do you specifically target a certain game to a certain publisher because of what you think they may add? How does that whole process work? This process is not happening through development. In development, my only objective is I want to have a super duper brilliant game. And I'm not forcing myself into either coming out as a card game or a tile game. It just goes where it is. I each game has its own personality, its own character, and I can only lead it, like a child. I can only lead it to its best development. That's a little bit psychological or philosophical, I should say. Um, but when the game is finished, of course, during the development, I make sure that the game is sellable. There are some themes and some sport things which you cannot really convey in games and nobody will take it. So I need to be aware of that. But on the other hand, once the game is finished, I will think very carefully what is the right publisher for that. Um, and this depends on various things. Firstly, I need to think about that because I have always got more games than I can show a publisher. I don't think that the attention span of a publisher during a meeting goes beyond 10 games you can show. And so I need to take a very hard selection because I have many more games in development, many more unpublished games, many more games which are available to other markets. And so one of the important secrets is, of course, to clearly understand what does the publisher want, what opportunities does he want to follow, and then to pick the right games for that publisher. Of course, there is a continuous co uh, communication between the publisher and us. And so I understand it. We have very open, confidential um, communication about the publisher strategy, about the publisher's challenges or not so successful games. So the more and more or new 
strategic approaches so that I can serve them best with the best games. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's important. There are some other aspects. Right. I, so let me I'm sorry, can I just want to, uh, uh, real quick then. So mm -hmm. since like you have such a plethora of games developed, and as you said, I'm sure you've got tons that are sitting there on prototypes, at what percentage, okay, so it's kind of like a two-part question. So right now, at what percentage of 100% are your games brought to a publisher as far as, you know, completion and what they add to it. And how has that percentage grown from say 20 or 30 years ago when you first started to now, like say, say 20 years ago when you brought a game, it was 60%. Now you've gotten up to 80%. So like, what, how, what is that like now? Yeah, I think in, in all um, respectful humbleness, I think my games are, in my view, perfect when I give them to the public. <laughs> and that's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a reputation I've built over many years. I mean, perfect is very much in the mind of the person, yes? Of course. And so yes. what I consider as perfect, I want to have my game perfect. That okay. is my subjective view. If my game is not perfect, if, my, if I'm not happy with my game to be 100%, then I would not show it to a publisher. Yes, so that's the first thing. And the publishers know when they get a game from me that the game is extremely well tested and the game works. Right. Uh, so, and that's one of the market advantages for me because when people, when the publisher, particularly now, I mean, we are quite busy now during the Corona period because publishers do not have the opportunity to test that much. And if they want to fill uh, some positions in line, they more come to us because they say, we know your games work and we just need to play it a bit and we know we can position it in our line so we know there are no basic problems with it, yes? So this is the one side about being perfect. And my urge or my, my desire to build that reputation and to deliver that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that clear proposal that we deliver in inverted commas, perfect games. Of course, I can never do a perfect game because a game always is created by the designer plus the publisher. I design a, and create a first handmade prototype, but the graphics, the final style of the rules, the whole presentation, the materials is done by the publisher. And so, and this brings me almost back to the last question where I said there are other criteria. One important criteria for me, criterion for me is that the publisher works as professionally as I claim that I work. And if we have a good relationship and the publisher do their job, then we get a perfect game. I cannot do the perfect game, despite what I said before, and the publisher cannot do a perfect game. It can only happen when we work together. Of and course. therefore, Finding a publisher who I think can do justice to this type of game, yes, more complex, more children's game or whatever it is, or more complicated materials uh, or something which we have such a big uh, complexity in the materials or in the graphics that we need a worldwide approach. So one individual market will not be able to finance it. And therefore I need to look at the network of the publisher. What can they position worldwide? So there are choices in there. But it's always the same. If you have a good game, it is a publisher plus me. Right. If it is, if you look at the end product, and that was your question as well, how much of my end product, of my game is in the end product? Yes. Um, often the game stays as it is, and the publisher fills, so to speak, the production around it. Right. Very, sometimes we discuss the change of the theme, as you already alluded to. Yes. And that is sometimes possible because I don't have the all the little bits and pieces and if we have a market in the oasis somewhere in the desert where the caravans come or if we are on a um, let's say on a modern city where we have the trains coming in with different or if you're on a fish market in China um, where the, 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 the different trawlers come in that can be done if you tell me we are now making out of this a skyscraper building game, then I have to say no because it doesn't fit at all. Yes. Right. So right. there are possibilities to stay within the 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 
spirit of the game and still change the setting of it. Yes. And okay. so this sometimes changes and sometimes for the really better. Um, and uh, what I'm trying to avoid is that the game is when it comes out less perfect than I put it in. Yes. Of course, you don't want that to happen. Now, now here's something that I've always wondered. Um, and so what exactly is a Reiner Knizia designed game? And what I mean by that, is it you or is Reiner Knizia a team or a company that designs the games? It is both. Okay. Um, I'm the lead person and I work on the designs. Um, there are no other designers who work for me and who, to whom I pass on projects and then my name goes onto it. That's not how it works. But game design is foremost play testing. And I have a wide circle of very experienced players who are involved almost on a daily basis, not the same person, but every day another group of people is coming to play test. And of course, we discuss a lot and I ask a lot of questions. And so a lot of the creativity and a lot of the good ideas actually come from this process. And that's why you see all the credits at the back of my games and the rules where I credit those people who have contributed the most. Uh, so it, yes, I am, so to speak, the the figurehead and I'm the driving uh, uh, force behind it, but it's not all created up there in my head. There are many more heads involved to contribute to that. And clearly without that, my designs could not be there. Yes, that's absolutely clear. And I don't think that any game designer can claim that because you have to test it. Yes. Yes. If I write a book, if I write a novel, I can claim that's from my head. Mm -hmm. yes. But uh, games are a social thing and you cannot, it doesn't matter how much experience you have, you cannot sit down and mathematically calculate the best game. Impossible. Right, right. You have yeah. to play it, you have to experience it. And it is a process which is an iterative step by step. It's almost by trial and error. Yes, we have some experience, but, you know, my games always work fantastically in my head. <laughs> and then we make the first prototype and then very often it's different. The reality is different and then we play it and sometimes yeah. it's big frustration, but it's certainly a big process of improving, playing, improving, backtracking, going, doing. So an iterative, mathematically iterative process to get there. Finally, we hope it converges there to say another mathematical word. Um, but, and, and today they, they use the, the expression design thinking, it's common sense. How else do you do it? You play and you improve. You play and you improve. I, uh, before I get, because I want to talk, I want to let the, the, the audience know about, you know, your accomplishments, your games, your awards and all that kind of stuff. But I have a personal thing real quick. So Poison, I absolutely love. And I have, I think, one of the very, uh, the first edition, I don't know. Um, now, when I first saw it, because this is something that I like, I immediately recognized the Voynich manuscript. Was that you or the publisher? Which manuscript? The Voynich manuscript, the the um, uh, writing. Um, there's a Voynich manuscript, which is something they still haven't deciphered. And in Poison, the iconography, the writing and stuff was from the Voynich manuscript. So I don't know if that was your idea or the publishers to put that in there. It was certainly not my idea because until you mention it, I, I... Oh, I think we lost the doctor. Oh, there he is. Cool. Can Sorry. you still hear me? Um, so, yes, I can still hear you. Sorry, okay. a call came in, but I, I cut it away. I'm sorry about that. But to say again, it's the first time uh, that I'm actually made aware of this, and I actually don't know this script. So oh, really? certainly it wasn't my idea. Uh, and if the publisher did it or if it happened by accident, I don't know. But um, Oh, excuse me, one second. Let me just grab it. I want to show you. you. Yep. So, uh, this is was this one of the first uh, editions? Yes. Yes, that was the, the edition by Playroom. Uh, well, there were editions before that, but that's why where the one where they essentially um, decided to put a nice picture of myself kind of on there, yes, to to spoil right. the game. Okay. So, um, you probably may not be able to see it, but the writing 
Uh, let me see if I can get the glare out of the screen. I can't. But this little writing. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I see that. Yes, yeah. The edges there. Yeah. So that is from uh, the Voynich Manuscript, which oh. uh, uh, to this day hasn't been deciphered. Uh, they still don't know what it means. And when I first saw that, I was like, oh, I, I, you know, that's that's why this game is so special to me because I've just been fascinated by the Voynich Manuscript. So, oh, there you go. I taught you something about your own game. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I, I, my guess would be that came from the illustrator, yes, from the graphic uh, person who said, I'll do something around it. And they took it. And uh, I assume we haven't broken any copyright because uh, it must be ancient. Uh, but uh, no, I was not at all aware of it. And that's how you discover things about your game. And that exactly reflects uh -huh. uh, and shows what I said about there are publisher and the publisher has uh, illustrators, uh, graphic designers, and there are lots of people who help together to make that product work. And everybody makes their contribution, as you just pointed out. Yes. Right, right, absolutely. So I first want to point out and congratulations on your nomination. On, but you did get a special award, I believe, from my city this year, correct? It was nominated for the Game of the Year. So it was uh -huh. amongst the last uh, three of the candidates. Um, but we didn't make it to top one. I, I know, but but again, being nominated is is fantastic. And I, I know that's probably not your end goal, or maybe even a goal. I don't know. I want. I don't want to speak for you, but you always want the best game. And I guess being or winning the award, even being nominated, is sort of a recognition of that. Is that part of the desire when you put out a game to hopefully be recognized as one of the best? Of course, I want to be one of the best or the best. I mean, you have to have the ambition. It's uh, it's not meant in a derogative way against the other people. Oh, of course. People should aspire to be be the best, yes? And I want to give the best I can. That satisfies me. I, mm -hmm. I don't want to do a half-cooked product. It's I don't need to do it. I have enough games. I strive for doing really good games <laughs> yep. and innovative games. And so, um, yes, as you say, we design a number of games every year. Not every game can be special. Um, it's it's not possible to stand out from the crowd with all the games. Uh, but there are some games who have particular potential. And um, that was the case, I think, with El Dorado. And that was, again, the case with uh, My City. And both were nominated for the mm -hmm. game of the year. And you know, it's important for me to stay relevant. Relevant means a lot of things, but it essentially it means to be able to reach a lot of people because they still enjoy my games. Oh, I do not want to rest, and I cannot rest on the laurels of uh, the 90s because um, I'm only as good as my next game. Correct. And even so, the doors to the publishers may be open easier, but they don't publish my games because they like me. They publish my games because... In, the, in comparison with others, it fits their range. And that's, and that's the ambition I have, and that makes a success. So with respect to my city, it's, I mean, of course, I would like to try make all the trends in the industry. Not possible. Right. So, but I don't want to make a Me Too product. And therefore, this, my city, I had the ambition to make a legacy product. Mm -hmm. Legacy is a big trend these days. Absolutely. But um, I said, what can I contribute? And I thought my strength comes in there by saying, can I not open this to the casual player, to the general family, because legacy games tend to be much more involved, have long rules, um, have all these different components, which I'm trying to cut down. And so the ambition was to create something which has a very easy access, uh, which opens the category of legacy gaming to a much greater audience. And that led to a relatively short gameplay of 20 minutes. That also led of, to the ambition of having no downtime. So now we have the city, everybody has a little board in front of them and everybody builds their own city, but we are always using the same building. So in the middle, we decide which is the next building and everybody builds the building and then comes a very big cathedral and it doesn't really fit in there. And so these are the little challenges you are, you are dealing with in the game, but it's short and we have 24 different games over eight chapters. In each right. chapter, you open the, the bag, 
uh, the envelope and you get some extra pieces and then yes of course you have the stickers and all the typical things which you need for a legacy game but it's it's the ambition is uh, here yes legacy has been invented by other people and it's a great invention um, so what can I do with it what can I contribute to it and I'm very happy and that's an expression of the award I'm very happy that I seem to have hit the target somewhat oh, absolutely. a lot of people yes yes being recognized that's a congrat that's a, a wonderful honor and congratulations on that that's very good and your first um sort of i guess uh worldwide recognition i for lack of a better term i don't know but with the spiel uh was in 2001 you won the literary award for your lord of the rings game so how did that feel and was it personally uh, sort of more of a validation stamp for you that, wow, okay, I am really starting to be recognized in the world, or did you or did you not even really need that? Well, accidentally in the background, you see some of the awards. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there, there are um, different awards in the world. I mean, I think the German Game of the Year is the most important with respect to impact of reaching people. Yes. But I was lucky enough, and luck is... A big part of it as well. You make your own luck, but you need to have the luck as well. And you need to be prepared. Uh, I believe in 1993, I won my first German game prize with okay. an art. Uh, I believe. Um, which is still published to this day. Fantastic. Which is still published to this day. We actually had an own exhibition just about the modern art games because there are so many different editions and so many different art works in there. But, yeah. So essentially, I was lucky to win these awards very early and that certainly gave me some recognition some visibility in the market and that makes things again easier right. and when you are a young game designer uh, you, you you're not so much aware of what it actually means to winning these awards i think the older you get the more you appreciate it the more the less so to speak, expected it is, and this is the less natural it is, and we see how big an honor it is, and also what an achievement it is. I mean, yes. it's it's um, it it doesn't it's it's almost sounds arrogant. I don't want to be arrogant, but it is. Um, oh, sorry for that noise. That's that's my uh, cat out there. You're gonna hear this whining. She's the world's loudest cat. I apologize. Yeah. Um, it is. It is not the origin of what I'm doing to win awards, right. but uh, it's a big honor to win the awards. And in a way, it is a recognition and it is, uh, so to speak, also the inside. Yes, I'm still on the right path. It's a right. tricky thing because if you, if you make your inner happiness dependent on outside recognition and awards, uh, you will, if you don't win them, suddenly become very unhappy. So I think you, it is important that the own drive is there and the own love for the game and that it's an intrinsic, intrinsic motivation to do games. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, outside success, outside recognition never hurts. And it is a balance, of course. <laughs> yes. That, and then... That's what it is. It's, uh, and it's, I mean, the ambition is to reach many people and you cannot, and if you don't win awards, you're obviously not reaching too many people. Yes. So that's, uh, that's right. And then in 2008, that. you hit uh, two out of three, actually, right? You won with Celtis, which was uh, the game of the year. And you also, I, I, where wars, I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. Um, there's an English version of that game we called, who was it? Who was it? Okay. And you won the children's field. Now that had to feel, phenomenal right like you had been nominated quite a bit you won the literary award but now you won game of the year until two in one year that that was a great year yeah that um, that was breathtaking that was uh, great and um, it's you see the two people behind me the big ones uh, so these are the two oh, okay. awards. Uh -huh. um, yes I mean yes you need to be very lucky to win two in one year um, but yes I'm happy and I take them as they come oh yes and, uh, and uh, yes, that was a unique uh, experience. And actually, the interesting thing was, at that time, I was not at the ceremony because I was stuck in oh, America. No. I was at a convention in America. I don't quite know which one it was, but um, and there was a big storm or so on, and the planes didn't go, so oh, I no. got stuck there. And, um, <laughs> 
So maybe I should not go to the award ceremonies more often. Maybe I win them more often. There you go. <laughs> so, Doctor, um, one kind of final question, and then just to sum it up, because I know you have to go, and I appreciate you taking the time. So out of all of your titles and all of your games, um, not that I'm looking for actual figures, but I'd like to know sort of two questions, and I think it might be interesting for all the people. So what has been perhaps, say, your number one earner, say, financially, and what has been your biggest evergreen if those are two, you know, you know what I mean? Two different things. Are there two different games that would fit those categories? The first question is easier to answer. Uh, my biggest financial success um, was, who was it? Which we just mentioned, because it is a high price product. It has uh, electronics in it, but it's a cooperative game. We still play around the table. And so that sold very, very well. Um, but there are lots of smaller games which you wouldn't actually expect to have also been quite a financial success. Uh, now, financial success is not the driving force. I need to live. I need to be able to afford my living. And I am easily able to do that. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, the question is, what? how, how else do you me measure success? That's much harder to define. I think I would probably point out Tigers and Euphrates. Tigers and Euphrates has been on the number one list of the Board Game Geek ranking for many years. And it is probably still one of my most complex, but my classic games, which get um, re republished and republished. And I've just entered into contract this month again for a new uh, publication of that game. I Usually I don't say that, but at the moment I'm thinking about, can I not do a Euphrates and Tigers special two-player game? So completely different. Um, oh, there you go. I'm never talking about un unfinished designs. It's, uh, I need to see. But so there are some classics there um, uh, which have, um, have made me very proud and I think reached a lot of people. Um, all my games are my children, and so oh, saying which one is my favorite one, and this one is uh, this one is above all the others. It's, there are different aspects to look at, and a game, a small game, you, you wouldn't believe some of the small bring along games sell actually very well, reach many people. Never ever written a review about it whatsoever because they are just relatively simple games, but they just seem to strike. Um, Strike it with the people, strike it with the kids. And so uh, if you look at Board Game Geek, there are the geeks, and they yep. um, lift and elevate different games. So what is an award, what is a financial success, what reaches a lot of people uh, can be, uh, or what makes me proud from, oh, that was really great, that makes me excited are very different aspects of it. And that's good because that means there is not one ranking and not one best game and that shouldn't be. Right, right. And finally, um, what can people expect from you, uh, like say within the next year? Cause I know uh, fortunately we're lucky that we're gonna be sharing your games or enjoying your games for many years to come. But in the media year, what can people expect coming out from Reiner Knizia? Yeah. Um, you said that's the last uh, that's the last question and the last question will remain unanswered because I have one clear principle and I think that's only fair when I license games to publishers I leave the marketing they take the economic risk of building up the game uh, producing the game building their marketing strategy and so I'm not interfering with it I'm supporting it but right. okay. the publisher knows best when they announce various things so I have one or two very exciting things in the pipeline that doesn't say anything now, um, which are out there for next year. COVID may influence it, but hopefully not. And um, okay, no, that, my... that, that's fine. So if you can't tell us exactly, but what you what you can say and what you just alluded to is we can expect uh, at least two games. You said that you're very excited about coming out from you next year. Right, so we can expect that. Oh, that's that's fantastic. I have a big cooperative game which I think uh, will hopefully make an impact. And it's and the other point is now we, we're not testing at the moment because of COVID. So, right, that means um, I have my 
famous 50 or 60 draws, which were mentioned many times in different interviews where each draw is one game. I have secretly bought another 30 draws now because wow. I'm sitting here, I'm doing <laughs> concepts. And, you know, it's, it's, this, is, this is actually more a curse because the ideas are piling up and having an idea is easy, but the discipline to see that idea through to a perfect product takes a long time. So I've been very ill-disciplined and have made more concepts and I couldn't test them and they're all waiting there for the testers now. And there is a lot, a lot, a lot of work, work in inverted commas, yes, waiting. Um, and hopefully some of these, you never know until you've played them for the first time, you never know. But uh, there are some, I have started some very big designs, uh, one very epic design, but uh, they need, still need a lot of testing. And um, I've, I've actually hired somebody uh, to um, support us and some, some uh, one more team member uh, to support me with the, with the selling side and with the licensing side. Wow, very and, good. And uh, that we had, we looked for a long time for finding the right person. We have found the right person. Next very month uh, we'll start. And this will free up, my hope is this will free up more of my time because you get also, you become the kind of the... Um, the victim of your own success. I mean, success yeah. is nice, and but there's not only sitting there and thinking about games. There's lots of business aspects. If you publish many games, you need to approve many games. You do the contract negotiations, this, this, and this, and this. And it all adds up every week, yes? And so it's important. It's, it's both things for success. It's, right. You need to be a good businessman, and you need to be a good designer. And bringing both together is important, and organizing yourself accordingly so that you're not... Giving up always the important for the urgent. The next email is the urgent one, and the, and the next uh, question about the game is urgent, and here comes a rule for approval, and so on. This is always urgent. And right. you want to give a good service to the publishers, but the important one is I need to do good games. Otherwise, there's nothing I can offer. True. And you said it's almost like a curse. And I'm sorry for this because just, you just stirred something up. You said it's almost like a curse because you're so prolific and you just have all of these things. So lastly, and I guess just to close this up and sum this up, is it is it that curse or you being so prolific, so creative, is that in essence the core of Reiner Knizia as a person? Or would it be and or a combination of all of your, say, training, your schooling, your education? Or do you think that's just kind of innately who you are? I think it is my enthusiasm and my drive uh, and my ambition uh, to say um, I want to create nice games. I have my open, uh, my eyes always open. It's, I, I live my games. I live the game design. That is my world. Um, and that's where my energy goes and that's where my ambition goes. And so, um, rightly so, therefore I should have ideas. And um, if, if, I, if I wouldn't bring some of these ideas to success, why would I spend my whole life on them? Then I would be wasting my life. And I don't think I am wasting my life. Uh, it's actually a dream life. I'm living with the games. And I'm, I, I can't say it often enough. I'm very grateful for it because it's a very lucky position to be in. And... Um, it's, I am in this position because of all the gamers who play the games. And so True. thank you for all the games. And of course, because of all of your hard work. Dr. Kanizia, thank you so much. We all in the gaming community appreciate all of your hard work, all of the fantastic hours of enjoyment you've given us by your games, by your products. And we look forward to many more years of continuing to enjoy your games. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Meepable Meets. We'll see you again soon. Bye.